Hi, real quick, before we get into the message today, I wanna to thank you for watching this message and jumping on our YouTube channel. I hope you're enjoying all the content, and before we jump in, I wanna encourage you to hit the subscribe button real quick and ring that bell. What that does is it makes you the very first to know all of the new content that comes out, and we'd also just love to hear from you. In the description, you can fill out the link and learn more and ask us any question you might have. Again, we're so grateful that you're here. Bless you. Let's get right into the message. Well, good morning. Good morning. You all doing good? Feeling good? We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, all of our locations, wherever you're hanging out with us, wherever you're um, attending today in Cincinnati, we just want to say hello to you. Dry Ridge, God bless you. And then our brand new location, Highland Heights. Uh, we just want to say God bless you. All of you that might be watching online, uh, all of you that are watching at Madison Correctional Facility or Blackburn Correctional Facility or via the Pando app, uh, those who are incarcerated all over the world, watch us and have church with us every single week. So I just love the idea of one church, many rooms. So maybe the room is Florence, maybe the room is Cincinnati, maybe the room is Dry Ridge, maybe it's a children's room, maybe it's a nursery room, maybe it's a youth room, maybe it's a college room, maybe it's a prison cell, maybe it's a hospital room, wherever the gospel is being preached, we just celebrate. The unique day, the unique opportunity that we have to uh, use the resources that God has given us to be a blessing to as many people as possible. And so we're just excited about all that God is going to do. If you're here today and you've never seen, many of you have probably seen one of our illustrated messages. It just We just take video, we take some music, and then we take preaching and we try to unfold uh, with the sight and sound generation some of these ideas that maybe you've heard about in a fresh and a new way. So really, this is just set back. Uh, enjoy it. Let God speak to you. Let God deal with you. We are going to be talking about uh, the end time specifically. What will the world look like or what would your life look like the day after the rapture? I'll explain more about that in just a minute, wherever you stand. I heard someone say one time, well, are you, are you, are you pre-trib, are you mid-trib, or are you post-trib? Is the question I get asked a lot of times. I'm like, well, today's message is more of a pre-trib focus. But if you're not quite there, we want you to know we don't think that you have to stand here to be saved or to be a part of Seven Hills. However, there is a biblical uh, precedence to consider this concept. But whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, I think the best place to stand is what I call pan-trib. Just means in the end, everything will pan out, right? It'll all pan out. So, so we're glad that you're here. Let's check it out.
I don't know the exact date of today. I think it's been maybe five years since that day. What we saw today was more of the same. Destruction, abandoned buildings. What the world used to be has been forgotten. There are a lot of words for it. The word I use is hopeless. It happened in an instant. It wasn't like this took place after a season or a slow build. Life was business as usual. Then, in a single day in history, everything changed. Everything. Everybody lost someone. I think that's what showed our true nature. Loss. Heartache. It was only a matter of time before everything fell apart. It was only a matter of time before the worst of humanity showed its face. Atrocities like I had never seen before. So we did what people who have no control over what is happening always do. We tried to control it. Then there were those who promised peace and safety. And for a time, that's what we got. But what seemed to be the solution ended up being a band-aid, masking the infection that was destroying everything underneath. If someone had told me that this is what the world would be like before that day, I wouldn't have believed them. Every day I hope to wake up from this nightmare. I'm holding on to anything from before that day, when there was hope. But hope is gone now. When we planned this series, we had, of course, no idea that yesterday Iran would attack Israel. The Bible says in Psalms 122 that our responsibility is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's our responsibility. And I feel like we need to do that in just a moment. But this is why I want you to consider that. Consider what we're talking about. The Bible says in Genesis 12 and verse 3 that God will bless those who bless Israel, that God will dishonor or curse those who curse Israel. So there is a biblical command to stand with Israel and to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's not to say we're not right now heartbroken for the people, the Iranian people. The underground church, by the way, uh, of Iran is a flourishing underground church. And so we would know that there's a difference between the people and their government. We would also know in Palestine that there's a difference between the people and the Hamas terrorist organization. Even there at Gaza Strip, there's an underground church that's around, it's very small, around three to 5,000 people, but whether you're in Iran or the Gaza Strip or in many of these Muslim nations around the world, you would be a part of what's known as, is, you know, really the underground church or the persecuted church of our day. Those churches and those people are ostracized, persecuted on a regular basis. And so our prayer is for the peace of Jerusalem, for the Iranian people, especially the underground church in these areas, these people that are brave and courageous, that don't have the freedoms that we have here today. And I wanna just say real quick that we're praying for our place as a country as well, that God will lead our leaders and speak to them it's very, very important that you understand policy, that policy does in many ways allow things like this to take place. That's why it's important that we know what we're saying and doing when we elect people because it does affect us here. The world, the Muslim world, refers to Israel as the little Satan. You wanna know who they call the big Satan? It's America, that's us. That's the church of Jesus Christ, by the way. And so I just want you to know that we're here today at a sobering moment looking at the idea of end times and we without question are seeing things unfold daily before our eyes. This is a day where we should be seeking God, praying like never before, knowing his word, right? You, you say, well, how do I know which side to be on? Well, be on the Lord's side. Don't be on my side, be on his side. You say, well, well, what's the Lord's side? What's, what's the Lord's side? Well, that's why you have to know the word. You have to know the scripture. His word is what? A lamp to our feet, a light to our path. There's times it's dark. I don't know what to do, but I know what the word says. And the word says that we're to 
pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I don't know the full scope of that, but I know when God says that I do that, that he blesses those who bless her. And I want my family blessed. I want your family blessed. I want this church blessed. I want our nation blessed. And because of that, I know our job is to just simply pray. And so, Father, we do that right now before we go any further. We have the unique privilege to be living in this time. And so, Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the innocent people caught in the crossfire. Father, we pray the name of Jesus over the Middle East. We speak the name of Jesus over the Jewish people. We speak the name of Jesus over those Muslim nations. And Father, we thank you for the Prince of Peace reigning and ruling in our hearts, reigning and ruling in those regions. In Jesus' name, Father, give our leaders wisdom to know what to do. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you. And we all said a big amen. Amen. I love the, the chance that we have today to take just a moment and look at what the Bible says about the end times. And so this is the scripture I want you to look at. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter four. For the Lord himself, I love that phrase. When Jesus comes back, he's not sending a prophet. He's not sending an angel. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up the word caught up there is the Latin word raptura. That's where we get the word rapture from. Rapture just simply means that, that God's church will be taken up, just as it says, we'll, be, we'll meet the Lord in the sky. The eastern sky will split and we'll go to be with the Lord forever. It says, so, so we'll be caught up, we'll meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. And this is the last phrase, this verse 18, I love this phrase. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So the purpose of talking about end times, according to the Bible, is so we can encourage one another with it. The purpose of talking about this is not that you'd be fearful, is not to be negative, is not to talk about destruction. The purpose is that we would encourage you today. And that's what we're hoping to do as we look at this subject together, is to encourage you over the next few minutes. So when you hear that phrase that, that the Lord will, will come back and we'll meet him in the air, if you were alive in Paul the Apostle's time when he wrote that verse in Thessalonians, you would know the imagery that he was speaking about concerning the church of Th Thessalonica. What he was really saying was that what would happen in every city in that area when Caesar was reigning and ruling is he would take trips to visit those regions and those cities. And when Caesar would come, the watchman on the wall would see from afar off, see Caesar coming, and the watchman would begin to shout throughout the city, Caesar is coming, Caesar is coming, Caesar is coming. The moment that that shout was said, everybody knew exactly what was going on. They would stop whatever they were doing. They would cease to work. They would leave their homes. They would grab their children and they together as a city would exit the city gates and go out to meet Caesar. Then like a parade together, they would march back to that city. Right when they got to the city gates, they would allow Caesar to enter first. Then they would follow in behind. So the idea when Paul was saying this, that that's what the return of Christ is like. It's something we're supposed to be looking for. Like watchmen on the wall, we're supposed to be excited about it. Whatever we do daily, we're not supposed to be clinging to it. We're supposed to be willing to let go of this world. We're supposed to be willing to let go of the things of this world because we know our destiny is not here on this earth. God has a greater destiny for us and we're supposed to be celebrating, watching, rejoicing the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in case you might think that this is a fringe subject, one out of 30 verses in the New Testament deals with the return of Christ. Two 
216 chapters in the New Testament, over 300 references concerning his return. 23 of the 27 New Testament books deal with this subject, and Jesus talked about his second coming so often that his own disciples continually ask him, when's it coming, when's it gonna happen, how will we know? Well, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter four is laying on his deathbed. He's talking about how he's finished the race, he's fought the fight, he's received his crown, and it says, he gives this key. He says, because I've loved and longed for his appearing. He goes on to say that if you wanna finish your race, if you wanna fight your fight, if you want your crown that's laid up for you, you have to be willing to be like he was, which was what? Longing for the appearance of Christ. You have to long for it, desire it, be an eager expectation for the return of Jesus Christ. There has to be something in you that's looking for it, waiting for it, expecting it. You're supposed to desire it. And Paul said, what you're going to experience is you'll finish your race like he did, you'll fight the fight in front of you, and you'll get the crown that God has in store for you as well. So let's continue to watch this story together so we can prepare our hearts to do what God's called us to do like Paul did in his generation. Check it out. Looking around today, I don't think I'll ever get used to how different things are now. We are someplace outside Chicago and still haven't seen any other survivors since Indianapolis. It's getting more and more rare to see the unmarked. Sarah is having trouble making the journey. She's so tired. The last we heard, there was a hospital in the area. Maybe there will be some supplies or medicine. The whole world has gone to hell, like someone snapped their finger and chaos took control. I'm struggling to find purpose, to find a reason to keep going, but I know Sarah needs me. It's been six years since I've seen you, and every day is as hard as the last. I'm holding on to a hope that we'll be together again someday, that I can hold you again, even if it's just once. I'll never forget that day. Memories are so strange. They're good and they're bad. They're good because they're all I have of you, but they're bad because I miss you. That day started off like any other day. What I would give to hear your voice, to see your smile, and hear you laugh again. My favorite thing was making you laugh. I would literally do anything to make you laugh. After lunch, we wanted to make paper airplanes. We watched so many YouTube videos. We got the best paper and probably made hundreds of paper airplanes. And then came the fun part, when we would test them. You ran outside, I chased you. But when I walked out, you weren't there. You were gone, vanished. All I saw was a paper airplane. Immediately, I felt a pit in my stomach. I knew something was wrong. We searched everywhere. We checked the house, every room, every inch, every hiding place. Anywhere we could think, I started to feel and hear my own heartbeat in my ears, like I was walking through a dream, a nightmare. We ran up and down the streets, looking for anything, any sign of where you might have gone. My head was spinning. Mommy kept looking at me for reassurance, asking me for answers. I didn't have any. It felt like my heart was jumping out of my chest, a lump in my throat, as I kept shouting for you. But all of the shouting in the world was only answered with the sound of distant chaos. The world felt like glass, the sounds of car crashes in the distance. People were screaming names of loved ones. Hopelessness filled the air on that day. The only sound was the sound of despair. Everyone lost someone, but saying that doesn't make it easier. I relived that day over and over again, and time hasn't helped. It hasn't taken away the feeling of my heart being ripped out of my chest every time I think about you. The hardest part is remembering the good times. You are my heart and my soul, and in an instant, without warning, on that day, you were taken from me. This feeling is death, because a part of me died that day. 
I want to see you again. I want to hear you laugh again. I want to hold your hand. There's a lot of people that were left behind on that day. I wish we could switch this life with the life we lost. I wish we could bring back the people we love. I wish we could make a deal with God. So a lot of people ask the question, what does is, what is all this mean? You know, we speak about the last days, or maybe they even say, like, what does it mean to my life? What does it mean to me? Hebrews chapter one, verse one and two says, in times of old, God would speak through his prophets, but now it says, in these last days, everybody say that, say, in these last days. And that's a powerful phrase. In these last days, he speaks to us through his son. So let's break down that phrase for just a minute so you can understand a little bit more about what the time we're living in actually means. The word these is a demonstrative word and it speaks of closeness. It speaks of nearness. If the writer of Hebrews would have used the word those, that would have spoke of something far away or something distant. For example, this is a demonstrative word. It speaks of something close. This stage, if I'm speaking about it, uh, something close, I say this. If I'm speaking about the stage in the children's church area or the youth area, I would say that stage. In other words, something that's distant or something that's afar off. So when the writer said these last days, he's speaking of closeness and nearness. The word last in the Hebrew speaks of destiny. That's probably the best translation of that word is it speaks of Destiny, or it's a destiny word because it's actually not talking about the end of something. It's more talking about destiny than it is anything else. Then you have the word days. It's plural for a reason because it's speaking of two worlds, two ages, two times coming together at once, the age that is, the age that's happening currently, and the one that is to come or the moment of destiny all coming together at one time. That's what the Bible means when it says these last days. It's speaking of the destiny of all of God's creation. It's speaking about everything that we've been created for coming together at one moment where the age that is and the age that is to come collide. Then the Hebrew word, when you take last days and put them together, it gives us a great image. And the imagery is of a man climbing up a mountain to reach the summit. 
And one generation climbs up so far, then they pass the baton to the next generation. They climb up a little bit further, and then they pass the baton to the next generation, and so on. Eventually, you get to the point where you're close to the top. I believe that's where we're at. Eventually, you reach the summit. That's what it means when the author said, these last days. It's speaking about reaching the summit of the mountain where you are limited in what you can see when you're climbing up the mountain because of what's in front of you. But when you reach the summit, you're no longer faced with that limitation. You have a 360 degree radius view and you can see over the full expanse of what you can see from that summit, the age that is and the age that is to come and you'll be able to see the destiny of God's creation on that day so when you hear about things like end times or the last days, think more like this. Instead of something negative or destructive, think about the destiny of God's creation. And this is what Romans 8 and 19 says concerning God's people when it comes to end times. That in my opinion, whatever you go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has planned for us. The whole creation is on tiptoe. That's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be on our tiptoe. Come on, if you're climbing a mountain, you don't climb it flat-footed. You're on your tiptoe is what it says. To do what? To see the wonderful side of the sons of God coming into their own. What's coming into our own? Realizing that the day we live in is a day of great destiny. It's describing when all of a sudden the limitations that we're faced with are removed, we're on the summit, and we can see exactly what God was up to in the past, what he's doing now, and what he has planned in the future. Ancient rabbis would say when Jesus comes back, literally what will happen is the dirt will cry out, get off me, curse. So when Jesus comes, even the dirt will say, I finally know who I am and what I'm supposed to do. That's the glorious, magnificent destiny of God's creation. So a lot of people say, well, how do you know when it's gonna happen? How do you know it's near? How do you know it's close? Well, Matthew 24, 36 says, no one knows the day or the hour. Not even Jesus knew the day or the hour. But this is the golden rule that's most important. The Bible is clear that people will not be ready. So whether that's him coming to us or us going to him, the golden rule is that people are not ready. Philippians chapter three, Paul the apostle with tears in his eyes, Tears streaming down his face, he's weeping, and he says Christians will not be ready because they're not focused on eternal things. They're focused on this world, they're enamored with this world, they're not focused on destiny, they're not focused on purpose, instead, they're focused on what James says is just a vapor. This life, it's a mist. It's the dash on the tombstone between two dates. We get so consumed with it that we miss the idea of immeasurable eternity, time and space, without measure. So Paul the apostle with streaming, tears streaming down his face says the church will not be ready. People will not be ready. And the reason why they're consumed with today, they're consumed with the here and the now. They're, they've got a white knuckle grip on the things of this world. But I believe God is freeing us from that today and helping us focus on the summit of God's magnificent destiny for his people. So we're living in the last days, but what should our response be? What should we do? Before I give you the answer to that, let's jump into this story a little bit more. Food is scarce. We don't really know when or what our next meal will be. It's hard to believe that the safest shelter we've found in months is an abandoned hospital. It's strange to think there was a time that we once threw away things that people literally kill each other over now. That's what has been revealed in this new reality. How ungrateful we were for the life we had. It's hard to be grateful in a time like this, especially when I know I could get the supplies we need in an instant. I could get the medicine and the food that we need to survive. We could be safe. We could be warm. No more running, no more scavenging. All it will take is a mark, one on the head, one on the hand. 
I remember when we would meet other survivors and talk about what was happening in the world. At first it was easy to be righteous. It was easy to see things like, I'd never let them put a mark on my body to buy groceries, to buy gas. But over time it got harder. We started to hear the same friends who would never get a mark had surrendered to it. They were living in a warm home. They weren't running. They weren't looking for food. At times I struggled. I could fix all of our problems with a simple mark. Take the mark, get food. Take the mark, have medicine. Take the mark, survive. I think many of you can remember, um, that are a little bit older, can remember growing up in a world where the idea of putting a chip in your hand or your forehead representing the mark of the beast that Revelation speaks about was so far out there, kind of a thought. And then 2020 hit, and we ran into the real reality that how quickly the laws could change that you cannot buy or sell unless you have this certificate, unless you've got this shot, unless, and it's all under the guise of loving others and safety and this and that and the other. It's a scary time that we live in. Of course, now the technology exists. What's the point of all that? The point of all that is if you get this chip, then immediately the EMT would know your health conditions, know your blood type, know... Uh, Children would be able to locate children in different parts of the world from being kidnapped. The idea is safety and protection. And we live in that day. And it's a sobering day that we live in. Again, we're not in fear of it, but we're also not ignorant. And so there's things that we're to do as God's people. First Peter chapter four and verse seven says, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and a sober mind, have a clear mind, why? So that you can pray. Then the next verse says, above all, above everything else, this is what we're supposed to do, love each other deeply. How do you do that? How do you love each other deeply? It says, love covers a multitude 
of sins. Not one sin or two sins or three sins, but most people are like me. You have a multitude of sins. It's a quiet church today. <laughs> then it goes on to say that we're to have hospita hospitality for one another without grumbling. Say it one more time. We're supposed to have hospitality for one another without grumbling. <laughs> Oof. Talk about the last days. The spirit, the attitude that is, the world is getting more and more crazy. You and I are supposed to love each other deeply, have a clear mind and show hospitality to one another. And it goes on to say, how do we do that? Each one use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of the grace, of God's grace in all of its various forms. And it goes on to say, if you have a gift to speak, speak. If you have a, a, a gift to serve, serve, and so on. And whatever you do, it says you do it unto Jesus, giving him the glory and him the honor. You don't do it unto people. You're really doing it unto him. And so three things quickly that the apostle Simon Peter said we need to do when we're in the last days. Number one, be clear-minded. What does that look like? Don't live your life believing the best days are behind us. Oh, well, I remember back in this generation, God did so many great things back during the Jesus movement. Or, or even if you go further back, look at what God did in the book of Acts. Look, look at those great days. Look at this great revival or that great revival. Can I tell you that heaven is full of a great cloud of witnesses right now? Those like Paul the Apostle, those like Simon uh, Peter, those like Elijah, those like Moses, those like Abraham. And you know what they're doing? They're surrounding that great cl that, that cloud of witnesses. They're watching us and they're jealous because you and I get to live in this day because we're so close. And we have to be clear-minded of that. Number two, we have to also love one another. And it teaches us how. Above all, love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't expose sin. It doesn't defend it. It doesn't justify it. It covers it. It still calls sin, sin, but it covers it. Meaning, love does not take a moment in someone's life, a sinful act, their past, them missing the mark, their failure. Love doesn't say in any person's life when you see that, they're disqualified. They're done. They're too far gone. It's over. And Jesus gives us this great moment with Simon Peter. He's just been arrested He's on his way to the cross. Simon Peter denies Jesus three times. Remember, he's at the fire with the girl and he denies Jesus with a curse. What that exactly means is debatable, but many would say that that means he, he gets to the point where he's so irritated and frustrated by her continual implying that he's a follower of Jesus that he blankety blank, 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 I'm not either. He leaves goes back to the life that he was living, which was fishing before Jesus found him. It uses his influence on the other apostles. They go back to the, the previous lifestyle. Jesus is raised from the dead. He shows up on the beach. Simon Peter recognizes him, jumps in the water, starts swimming to Jesus, gets on the shore. He's dripping with water, and the Son of God does not bring up the sin. Does not bring up, oh, I saw you cussing, Peter. I saw you denying me. He doesn't bring that up. What does he do? He says, do you love me? Well, of course you know I knew. No, no, do you love me? What's Jesus trying to do? He's trying to teach Simon Peter that there's something greater than his mistakes. There's something greater than his failure. There's something greater than his sin. And we would know that Jesus said to Simon Peter concerning the church upon you or the revelation that you received that he was the Messiah, I will build the church, my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So one of the keys of thriving as the end time church is let love cover a multitude of sin, recognizing that the sin and the mistakes in people's life does not ultimately define them. Once we get that as the church, we become greater, so great that no matter what the gates of hell throws at us, we prevail against her or against it. 
Then number three, I'll go really fast with this one. Each one of you should use whatever gift you have to receive or you've received to serve one another. So I want you to think about what that means. It simply means that in the last days, don't get flat-footed. Don't go back down the mountain. Don't hide out. We keep pressing forward saying, I'm gonna use my life and what God's given me to make a difference. And by the way, I can, with verifiable facts, show you how right now you are alive in the greatest generation that's ever been on the planet before. You ready? Over seven billion people on the planet. More people have come to Christ in the last five years than the 2019 years before this combined. Think about it. In 708 AD was when Islam began. In its first 1300 years of existence, there was zero movement inside of the Islamic religion towards Christ. In the last 20 years, in all nine branches of Islam, over a million Muslims give their lives to Christ every single year. There is a revival <laughs> happening. In China, every day, 35,000 people get saved. Of the 1.3 million Chinese under the communist regime right now, 130 million or 10% are born again, Bible-believing Christians in the underground church. Again, we live in the greatest generation in history. Not because I'm saying it, but because the facts represent it. God's pouring out his spirit. You need to know that. God is moving. God is up to something more than he ever has been before. You say, yeah, but is darkness increasing? Absolutely. Is sin increasing? Absolutely. But where all of that abounds, grace much more abounds, which means you and I need to be a part of what God's doing in the earth. And we're a part of it by being sober-minded, clear-minded. We're a part of it by, by simply having the thing on the inside of us that says, I'm gonna use the gifts and talents that God has given me, that he's equipped me with to live my life saying, I know I'm in the last days, but I'm expecting Jesus to come back, which means I give all I can, I do all I can, I pray all I can, I love all I can. All I can do, I do. I live my life to the fullest. Why? Because I wanna be ready. I don't wanna be caught off guard. I wanna be ready for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. So let's continue to watch how Sean's story unfolds. I could fix all of our problems with a simple mark, but Sarah wouldn't let me. I didn't understand why she wanted to continue living this way. And then she got sick. At first it just slowed her down. We thought she had a cold. Then it slowed her down a little more. Maybe all she needed was some time and rest. Until finally, she couldn't travel at all and the reality set in. This wasn't going away. We didn't have the answers and there was only one way to get them. We would search any and every place we thought we might find medicine or supplies. Sometimes we would get lucky and find something to manage the pain. But all of it was just a band-aid. We were the unmarked and we were running out of time. Take the mark, get food. Take the mark, have medicine. Take the mark, survive. But she wouldn't have it. And even though it hurts, I made a promise. Even when my 
solid rock to build my life. I'm not sure who I'm writing this to. Maybe it's just for me. But it's been nearly seven years since that day. Seven years in a lost and hopeless world. But even in times that seem hopeless, hope can be found. Had I known what I know now, maybe I would have been able to save my wife and myself from what this world has become. Had I known what I know now, I would be with Emily. We would all be together. I may be a little late to this realization. I wish I could go back and change some things. I wish I would have taken certain things more seriously. But one thing's for certain, this time I'll be ready. I won't miss him when he comes again. I'll be waiting, I'll be ready. I've been broken, I've been beaten. I've seen the unforgettable and the unimaginable, but I won't let it shake me, I won't give up. 
And even if the road ahead is perilous, I'll put my trust in you. If there's darkness on the horizon, I'll put my trust in you. I will no longer be held up by my own strength this time. I've put my faith in Jesus. In this hopeless world, I have found a solid rock. I have found a firm foundation. I've witnessed it and I'm confident 
Let's give Jesus a good hand clap, can we? You can remain standing. I feel like the ending moments are sometimes the most important moments in a service. When we miss the moment, right? Faith is now. So you, you gotta right now, by faith, embrace these next few moments as life-changing moments for many. And if that's not for you, it's for somebody. And so just at all of our locations right now, it's just so important that we stay prayerful, uh, that these are divine moments where God, God's word has gone out and it doesn't return back void, but it accomplishes what he sent, out, sent it out to do. I want you to think about the, what the Bible says about the power of, of us being alive in this moment. This is what Psalms 139 says that you form my inwards part, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, but it was intricately woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw an unformed substance. This is my favorite part of the verse, listen to it. In your, in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me. When as yet there were not one of them, one of what? The days of the earth. God formed you before he formed the first day on this planet. Which teaches us when God formed these days, he formed them for you and for me. Before the foundations of the earth, God knew exactly the day and hour that you and I would show up on this planet. When you were born, what happened is you collided with your destiny. You collided with your purpose. Time and destiny happened for you. So in the day that we're living, because you're here, because you're breathing, it's the evidence that God has uniquely gifted you, equipped you, for this exact time. And my prayer would be that you would fully embrace and grasp that every single second, every single minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year was formed with you in mind. Your job is to recognize God created this day with me in mind and time has been expecting us. It's been expecting us. All creation groaning is what the Bible says, waiting for the sons of God to come into their own. In other words, it's time for us as Christians, it's time for us as believers, it's time for us as the church of Jesus Christ to get to the point where we pick up our mantle, our end time last day mantle, and we make the decision that I'm living in these last days. This is a moment of destiny, and I need to live longing for his appearing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise the name of Jesus. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Are you on your tiptoes today? Are you eagerly waiting? Are you excited? Are you living with destiny in mind, purpose in mind? Well, I think right now would be a good moment to say, God, help me focus on the eternal. Are you using your gifts? Are you using your talents? Are you wasting your days? Are you wasting your time? The Bible says giving your days over to the cruel one. Don't do that. Don't give your days over to fear. Don't give your days over to intimidation. Don't give your days over to the things of this world. God's got a higher call on your life than that. And I commission you. I commission you to be about the high call of Christ Jesus today. In Jesus' mighty name. Raise this church up. Raise these families up. Raise these people up. Raise those who are hearing this message up for such a time as this, in Jesus' mighty name. Are you here, or maybe at one of our locations, and you'd say, Marcus, I'm not right with Jesus Christ. I'm not ready for his soon return. 
If that eastern sky were to split and he would come back, I know I wouldn't be ready. I know, I know that I'm living my life for self and for the here and the now. I'm caught up in sin. My life is consumed with, with the things of this world. And today you would say, I need to turn back to him. I need to give my heart to him. I need to surrender to him. At all of our locations, this would be the moment to do that. You don't have to walk out of here fearful. You don't have to walk out of here not ready. Right now, in this moment, you can say yes. Right now, in this moment, you can turn to him. Right now, in this moment, you can give him your all, surrender all to him, give him your heart. And the Bible says he makes all things to be brand new. All things. He'll restore every year that the enemy has stolen from your life. And he'll replace it with great purpose. I want you to know today, judgment is not waiting for you. Mercy is waiting for you. So if you're here and you'd say, Marcus, would you pray for me? I need to get right with him. I want to be a part of what God's going to do on the earth in these last days. I want to know today, assured in my heart, that I'm right with God, that I'm his son, I'm his daughter, that I'm forgiven, that I'm cleansed, that I'm washed by his blood that he shed on Calvary's cross for me. And you would like me to pray for you. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand as high as you can. At every one of our locations, it's the same way. If you say, Marcus, I need to get right with God today. I don't wanna leave the same way I showed up. I need God to do a new thing in my heart, my life. I need a new beginning. Throw that hand up as high as you can. One, two, three. Throw that hand up as high as you can. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep your hand raised if you can. Thank you, thank you. Many hands are going up. Please don't put it down quickly. At all of our locations, the same thing. Put your, you say, what am I putting my hand up for? You're saying yes. That you're making a statement. You're making a statement to God. You're making a statement to the devil. You're making a statement to yourself that today is the day of my salvation. And that's what the Bible says. Today is the day. Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. That's not your promise. The promise is now. Today, this moment, you seize it, you grab a hold of it, and you don't let it pass you by. And that's when you lifted your hand, I believe that was a moment of faith, a step of faith, where you are saying, I'm not leaving the same way that I came. I need God. I need saved. I need a new beginning. Let's all put our hands on our hearts. We're going to pray with those who lifted their hands at all of our locations. Let's pray this together. If you lifted your hand, this is a prayer for you to pray from your heart to God's heart. Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is God's only son. That's what we're going to do. And that he raised him from the dead. So say this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, and wash me. I give you my life now. I believe that you're God's only son and that he raised you from the dead. And I give you my heart now. I give you my life now. Fill me with destiny. Fill me with purpose. Fill me with your spirit. Let me know that I'm your son or daughter and that I'm forgiven and that I've been made new today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more good hand clap together. Thank you so much for watching the message today. And if you've stuck around to this point, we would love to get connected and learn more about you. Hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.